Duke of Joe here. Today we're going to take a look at this game, Downfall of the Third Reich, a game designed by Victor Catala and to be published by Do It Games through a Kickstarter campaign that begins on February the 28th. This is a two to three player grand strategic World War II game in Europe from 1940 to 1945. It starts with the Germans and Soviets having already gobbled up Poland. And this is a game with a short set of rules, but it is not simplistic. And it attempts to recreate World War II in one sitting of four to five hours with realistic results and without having to read 50 plus pages of rules and having to consult tons of tables and charts. It leaves all the hard decisions for the players. It uses a variable sequence of play where players will receive action points and they can use those action points to conduct actions and they can also conduct army operations and they can do these in any order that they want. Of course, they will never have enough action points to do everything that they want and that's where the hard decisions come into play. And I saw many people playing and enjoying this game at the Bellota Con in Badajoz, Spain this January. So let's take a closer look at Downfall of the Third Reich. Let's take a look first at the game's components and with the caveat that this is a prototype and component quality is always subject to change but as you will see the components in this one even at the prototype level look very nice. The game includes a 24 by 34 inch mounted map board, 105 square shaped 5 eighths of an inch counters that represent the armies of major and minor nations. 26 5 eighths of an inch round counters for air and submarine missions. There are other square and round shaped markers. One player aid sheet, three dice, and one 16 page rule book. The actual rules cover only eight pages and the rule book includes a setup illustration, designer notes, and illustrated examples of play. The ground units in the game are armies and infantry armies are represented by a soldier icon while armored armies show a tank. The number on the upper right hand corner is the strength of the army. The back of the counter shows the army at reduced strength. Round air mission counters can be used to strengthen one's attacks but only if the player has the aviation development tile. The back side of the counter is the advanced air mission side which can only be used if the player has developed the advanced aviation tile. The allies can use advanced air mission markers to conduct strategic bombing which can only be countered by the Axis player with his advanced air mission counters. If the Axis player places two submarine mission markers in the Battle of the Atlantic box, the Allies will lose one action point during their next turn. If the Axis has the advanced warship development tile, only one submarine marker is necessary for the Allies to lose their action point. However, if the Allies develop the advanced warship tile, then the non-advanced Axis submarine missions, the one showing the Type 7, do not have any effect in the game. There are also markers to denote control of an area, as well as markers to show which armies have already moved and which are eligible for attack. There are also markers to keep track of accumulated supply points which are important for armies to move and fight, as well as armor points which are important for a player to bring in new armored units or strengthen reduced armor units to full strength. And there are action markers to show which actions a player has already taken during his turn. Finally, the game includes rectangular shaped development tiles. These improve the quality and ability of a side's armed forces. The map shows Europe divided into areas, and areas are color-coded according to each of the nations. 
Supply areas are denoted by round supply symbols, and units in this game must be in supply at the end of one's turn. If one still has units unsupplied, they are eliminated. Key areas are denoted by a star, and these are important for a side to be able to fully receive reinforcements. Impassable areas are denoted by diagonal stripes, like for example, Turkey and Spain. As to terrain types, the map shows forests, marsh, mountains, high mountains, rivers, straits, as well as fortified lines and fortresses. Coastal areas with an arrow pointing at them are areas that may be invaded by amphibious landings with more than one army. Coastal areas that have a denotation, however, can only be invaded amphibiously by one army. Deep inside the Soviet Union is the Eastern Line, and any Axis units operating to the east of this line have to spend an extra supply point to do so. There are resource spaces in Trondheim, Bucharest, Grozny, Baku, and Suez, and these have an impact on a side's number of action or supply points. For example, if the Allies take control of Trondheim, the Axis will have one less action point during any total war winter and spring turn. The map also shows a turn record track, as well as holding boxes for each of the players to place their available air mission markers. And there is also a space for each faction to place development tiles that have been selected for completion. Victory in this game depends on German surrender. If Germany surrenders during the last turn of the game, that is turn 22, the game ends in a draw. If it surrenders any turn before turn 22, the Allies and Soviets win. However, if turn 22 ends and Germany has not surrendered, the Axis wins and Germany surrenders when the Allies and or Soviets control all of their supply areas, namely the Ruhr, Munich, Berlin, and Breslau. The game is played in turns, with the Axis player going first, followed by the Allied, and then the Soviet player. Sequence of play in this game is variable. During a turn, a player spends action points to conduct actions, and the player can also conduct army operations, and the player can conduct these in any order that the player wants with certain limitations. Each player receives a specific number of action points with which a player can perform certain actions, which are the following, each costing one action point. A supply action increases the number of supply points in a player's stock. Supply points are used in this game to conduct army operations, which includes movement and combat with one's armies. A player may conduct a reinforcement action to bring new units onto the map or to flip reduced strength units on the map to full strength. An air mission action increases the number of air mission markers a player receives, and these air mission markers are used in attack to increase the combat factor of the attacking units. The Axis player can take a naval missions action, and this increases the number of submarine mission markers that the Axis player can use in the Battle of the Atlantic which is a way of reducing the number of actions available per turn to the Allies. Players may perform a development action to either begin or complete a particular technological development that will enhance the performance or quality 
of a player's armed forces. And finally, the Lend-Lease action is an action that the Allies can take to provide the Soviet player with an extra action per turn. Let's take a look at the sequence of play in this game. The sequence of play is very fluid because it is, it is dependent on the actions that a player takes and when to conduct them during his turn. In this example, it is turn seven and the Germans decide to invade the Soviet Union. So this is what is called the Barbarossa turn. And the effect that the Barbarossa turn has in the game is that total war status will begin during the next turn, that will be turn eight, and will affect only Germany and the Soviet Union. The Allies will begin in total war status in the first turn for 1942. Now, for this particular turn, turn seven, the Axis has three actions. Notice that under total war status, the Axis has four actions per turn. So in this turn, it is three actions, and the Axis does the following. The Axis starts by receiving Italian reinforcements and supply. As long as Italy is in the war, on the Axis side, the Axis will receive Italian reinforcements and supply points at the beginning of the Axis turn, irrespective if the Axis player played a reinforcement action or not. Next, the Axis player conducts army operations using accumulated supply points and conducts these operations with certain units. Next, the Axis player places air mission markers in attacks caused by those units. Now the Axis player conducts his first action of the turn, a supply action, and adds supply points to his stock. And now the Axis player conducts additional operations with other armies. Next, he places additional air mission markers in attacks caused by those armies that just moved. And now the Axis player resolves attacks. And this is important because once combat is resolved during a turn, that player cannot spend any more supply points to conduct operations. After resolving attacks, the Axis player performs the armor production action and adds armor points to his tally. And finally, the Axis player performs the reinforcement action, and this is the third of his three actions, and this ends the Axis player's turn. And notice that the Axis player could have performed, if he wanted, any of those last two actions, the armor production or reinforcement actions, before resolving attacks. So the sequence of play is very fluid, and the player will determine when he needs to conduct certain actions and operations on a case-by-case -case or turn-by-turn -turn basis. Let's take a look at some examples of play on the map board. After resolving the Axis attacks during turn 7, which in this example is the Barbarossa turn, a section of the Soviet Union ends up as shown here. In this example, each country controls its home areas, so the Axis controls Konigsberg and Warsaw, which is in the color of Germany, and the Soviets control all pink-colored areas that you see, with the exception of one, which is Devinsk, because this is controlled by the Axis by being the last side to occupy the area alone. The Soviets don't have the Blitzkrieg development tile yet. Therefore, Soviet armies in Vilnius cannot trace a line of supply to a supply source because there are German armies in all the surrounding areas. The rest of the Soviet armies, however, do have a line of supply. And what is the situation as to the German supply status? The German armor armies that you see here in Devinsk, as well as Minsk, are in supply. The Germans have the Blitzkrieg development tile, so they can trace a line of supply through spaces that contain German armies in Riga or Kovel, even though these areas are not controlled by Germany. 
So let's assume now that it's the Soviets' turn seven. And let's take a look at an example of tactical movement versus strategic movement. There's a very important rule as to tactical movement regarding units that are in the same space as enemy units at the beginning of the turn. From an area that contains enemy armies, you cannot move your armies tactically during all the movement to any uncontrolled area or to any area that contains enemy armies. And the only exception is blitzkrieg exploitation movement. Here we see the Soviet army in Riga, which also contains three German armies. That Soviet army cannot move to Konigsberg because Konigsberg is not controlled by the Soviets, and it cannot even do so by passing first through a controlled area like Vilnius. Also, the Soviet army in Riga cannot move to Dvinsk because it does not control Dvinsk, nor can it end up in an area with an enemy army. And finally, the Soviet army in Kovel cannot move tactically to Minsk, even though the Soviets control both areas because in Minsk there are enemy armies. So we have seen tactical movement that the Soviet player cannot make. But in this game, there's also strategic movement, which is a form of movement that allows a player to move an army and unlimited number of friendly areas. So let's take a look at the Soviet army in Kovil. That army could move strategically to Minsk because the Soviets control Kovil and Minsk. Now, the downside for strategic movement is that after performing the movement, you cannot attack with that unit during the turn. Now, the Soviet armies in Vilnius, however, cannot move because they have no line of supply at the start of their turn. And if at the conclusion of their next turn, they are still unsupplied, they will be eliminated. Now, let's say that this is the situation at the end of the Soviet turn number seven and the two armies in Vilnius cannot trace a line of supply, so they are eliminated. And let's also assume that the Germans now are going to conduct turn eight, and they conduct a reinforcement action to upgrade their reduced infantry army in Kovil and their reduced armored army in Minsk to full strength. And these armies, of course, could be upgraded and reinforced because they are in supply, because the Germans have the Blitzkrieg development tile. Now, for the Germans to bring to full strength their reduced armored army, the Germans have to spend one reinforcement point. And a reinforcement point is derived from a reinforcement action. And in addition, the Germans must spend an armor production point. And if a player wishes to construct a new armored army to full strength and bring it on the board, the side would have to spend two reinforcement and two armor points. And now we see a very interesting situation as to tactical movement versus supply. And this is how this game, which is simple, is nuanced. The German armies in Stalingrad have a line of supply through Voronezh and Rostov to the west, so they can attack in Stalingrad. But notice that they cannot move tactically and exit Stalingrad because they would pass through areas that have enemy armies or areas that are controlled by the enemy. So note that the German armies in Stalingrad are limited to attacking inside Stalingrad. They could not move, let's say, to Rostov because there's Russian armies there. They could not move into Voronezh or into Lugansk. So with simple rules, we see how this game can simulate when the Soviets were attempting to encircle the uh, German armies in Stalingrad. They can still attack and they're still in supply, but they cannot move in a way that they would be able to attack adjacent areas. Now, what about strategic movement? In this case, the German armies 
cannot leave Stalingrad with strategic movement because they do not control Stalingrad. And strategic movement requires that you control the area from which you're moving to and each area you are moving through. And of course, to control Stalingrad, the Germans have to be the sole occupants. So they would have to eliminate those two guard armies there. Let's take a look at how tactical movement and exploitation movement works so that you get an idea of how the Germans got to the positions that they got into in the prior Barbarossa example. So let's assume this is the Barbarossa turn and this is the beginning of the turn and the Germans are now going to conduct army operations to attack the Soviets. Army operations in most cases cost one supply point per army operation. The Germans have nine supply points accumulated. So we begin by taking a look here in the vicinity of Riga. The Germans move their two infantry armies from Konigsberg, one movement point each into Riga. And armies have a movement allowance of three, so they have two movement points left each, and you only need to have one movement point left to be eligible to attack. So we place attack markers on both units so that this reminds us that they're eligible to participate in combat later on. Now, this movement that you saw cost the Germans two supply points. So now they have seven left. Next, the Germans move one of their infantry armies in Warsaw through Konigsberg and also into Riga. And this army has one movement point left, which is enough to make it eligible for attack. And we mark the unit accordingly. Now the Germans check for eligibility for exploitation movement by that German armored unit in Konigsberg. In this game, attacking and defending is done on a one-to-one -one basis. So one attacking unit attacks a defending unit. And you see there are three German armies in Riga and there's two Soviet armies. So you see that there's one extra army for the Germans because they have one more army than the Soviets. So the extra army can support an attack and that's why we placed it behind one of the German armies. So in order for exploitation movement to occur, there has to be a final difference of plus four or more between the attacking and defending units. So we start with five, which is the combat factor for the German unit, and we add plus two for the supporting German unit because it is at full strength. If it was a unit at reduced strength, it would only add a plus one. So we're at seven, and the Soviet combat factor is three for the unit's combat factor. The terrain, which is plain terrain, adds nothing here. So the final difference is plus four. That makes that space eligible for Blitzkrieg exploitation. Of course, to do that, the side has to have this tile, the Blitzkrieg development tile, but the Germans have it. So that means that the armored unit in Konigsberg moves into Riga and one more area into Devinsk. Exploiting units can move just one area beyond the exploitation area. So it has to be an adjacent area. So that's the exploitation movement, Blitzkrieg exploitation movement performed at that, by that German army. And note that all movement in this game has to be performed before combat. Later on during the turn, the attacks will be resolved. So it is sometimes risky to conduct these movements if the attacks don't go as well as planned. And now we're gonna take a look at the situation further south. Here the Germans move their infantry army from Warsaw and one of the infantry armies from Tarnow into Kovel. And note that the attacking German armies can only achieve a plus two uh, differential here, not eligible for exploitation movement. However, the Germans now bring into play one of their air mission markers and it is placed here in Kovel to support the attack by the topmost German unit. And now the attack differential is 
five for the attacking German unit, plus two for the supporting air mission marker, seven, minus three for the Soviet combat factor is four. Again, terrain here is plain, so it does not enter into the equation. And because there is a plus four achieved here, now that particular area is eligible for exploitation movement. And now this German armored army moves through Kovel to an adjacent area, and it will be Minsk. And similarly, the German armored army here in Tarnow moves into Kovel and also ends up in Minsk. And note that all these German units are eligible for attack because they have one or more movement factors left. And in addition now, the Germans bring in their second air mission marker and place it here with their armored units in Minsk. So it will be adding plus two to their combat factor in the upcoming attacks. Now we just saw a total of seven units being moved and marked eligible for attack. And that means that seven supply points were spent, so the Germans would have two left. Now, whenever the Axis decides to resolve combat, all units that are eligible do not have to attack. So let's say that they will attack with this unit, with this other unit in support, this Soviet unit, but they will forego the attack with this other infantry unit. So let's resolve combat in that particular space. We start with the Germans combat factor for the attacking unit of five, plus two for the supporting unit, which is at full strength, seven, minus three for the Soviet defending unit, four. There's no adjustment for terrain, so it is a plus four. So now each side rolls one D6. We add the die roll to each of the side's combat factors. The Germans had a 7 plus 3, 10. The Soviets have a 3 plus 2, 5. So the total result is the Germans 10 and the Soviets 5. In this game, the highest scorer wins the combat and receives one casualty unless the difference in score was double or more, which is the case here. So the Germans would not be reduced and the Soviet, the defeated army, receives always two casualty points. So the first casualty point reduces the Soviet army and the second one eliminates it. Now let's assume, for example, that the role was a German one and a Soviet five. The Germans would end up with eight and the Soviets also with eight. In that case, each army would receive one casualty point, and that is reflected here by reducing each of the armies. Now, let's suppose that the Soviets would have rolled a six and the Germans a one. The total German combat factor would have been eight, while the Soviets would have been nine. In that case, the Germans are defeated. They lose two steps, eliminating the attacking army, and the victorious defending Soviet army is only reduced by one step. Now let's suppose that the attack was against a reduced army. In this example, it is against a reduced Soviet army and the total attack strength of the Germans is nine and the Soviets seven. In that case, the reduced army is eliminated and the attackers suffer no casualty points. So you can see there's a lot of possible results. Combat system is simple, but combat is not a foregone conclusion, nor is it the number of casualty points. Uh, in theory, the victor will most of the time lose one combat step unless the difference was double or more, or unless the defeated army was reduced. In this example, two Allied armies have moved to Brussels. Here, the British Infantry Army is conducting an amphibious landing from the UK, and the American Armored Army entered the Brussels space via tactical movement. And let's see 
how the designation of the attacking army affects the combat situation. And the Allies add an air mission marker to the space. Now the Allies have to decide which is the attacking unit in this situation. If they decide that the British Army is the attacking unit, that British Army is conducting an amphibious landing, and that would give the German defenders a plus one to their combat factor. The American Armored Army could support in that situation. However, if the Allied player decides that the American Armored Army will be the attacking army, then the British Army, which is amphibiously landing, cannot support the attack. Now, in Frankfurt, the Americans moved in two American armored armies by crossing the Rhine and added an air mission marker. Here, the attacked German army would get a plus one to its combat factor because the attacking army crossed the Rhine River in the same turn. Now, let's say that it is the following turn and both American armies remain there and then attack now the Germans would not benefit from their plus one because they would be attacked by one allied armor army that is already in Frankfurt. Now let's say that in the next turn, the German army in the Ruhr moves into Brussels and attacks an allied army. The allied army would not receive the benefit from the river, that plus one, because the river is in the Ruhr area, not in the Brussels area, and it is not considered to be crossed in this attack. In this example, three German armies have moved into Kalini and two into Tula, and in Tula, the Axis player decides to attack with the armored army and brings an air support marker. The total strength for the Germans is 10-6 for the armored army, plus two for the supporting infantry army, plus two for the air support marker. The Soviet strength is six, five for the defending tank army, plus one because this is a fortified area as denoted by the black hexagon. So the total differential is plus four, and you would think that that would make that space eligible for exploitation by the German armored army here in Bryansk. But no, fortress spaces are never eligible for exploitation. And of course, if there would have been no fortress in Tula, that exploiting armored unit could have reached Moscow. Let's see how the combats are resolved here on the Western Front example. Let's start with Brussels. The Allied player decides to attack with the amphibious landing infantry army with the support of the armored army. So the attacking combat factors are eight. That's four for the amphibious landing army, plus two for the supporting army, plus two for the air mission marker. And the defending combat factors for the Germans is six, five, for the unit that is defending plus one because it is defending from an amphibious landing. So it is eight to six. The allies roll a two and the Germans roll a five. So the result is allies 10 and Germans 11. So the Germans win by one. So the British infantry army is eliminated and the German infantry army is flipped to its reduced side. Now let's resolve the combat in Frankfurt. The topmost American army attacks a German army. Note that the other American army will not attack and it cannot support the first American army because the two sides have the same number of armies in the area. So the Americans have six for the attacking army plus two for the air mission support marker for a total of eight and the Germans have six, that is five for the defending army unit, plus one because the Americans crossed a river. The Allies roll a three and the Germans roll a five. The result is a tie, 11 to 11. So both armies are flipped to their reduced sides. 
Now let's resolve the attacks in the Eastern Front. In Kalining, the Germans decide to attack only one Soviet army, since the Germans' extra army can only support one attack. And attacking the other Soviet army is somewhat risky. The Germans have an attack strength of 5 for the attacking army plus 2 for the supporting army for a total of 7, compared to the Soviets who have 3 for the defending army plus 1 for the forest terrain for a total of 4. So it is 7 to 4. The Germans roll a 5 and the Soviets roll a 2, so the German result 12 is double the Soviets result of 6. So the Soviet army is eliminated and the Germans take no casualties. Now we go to Tula and the Germans have a combat factor of 6 for their attacking armored army, plus 2 for the supporting infantry army, plus 2 for the air mission marker for a total of 10. And the Soviets defend with 5 for their tank army, plus 1 for the fortified space for a total of 6. And the role is a Soviet 6 and a German 1. But wait, in this game, whenever armored units from the Germans are attacking in Russia in a space that is a plain terrain space like this one here, the minimum that they can roll is a 3. And the same applies to the Africa core unit of the Germans in Africa as well as British armor in Africa. So the German role is a 3 and the Soviet role is a 6. So the combat result is 13 for the Germans, 12 for the Soviets. So the Soviet army is eliminated and the German armor army is reduced. In this example, two German armies move to Reims and one of the German armies attacks a French army with air support. So the Germans have five for the army plus two for the air support marker seven and the defending French army has three. So the difference is four and this triggers exploitation movement by the German armor unit in Frankfurt which moves into Reims and in this game stacking is up to three units uh, per side per area and then moves via exploitation movement into Nancy and attacks a French infantry unit. When you enter with your units a hex that is occupied only by enemy units, your units have to make at least one attack. Note that if the Germans move their army in Stuttgart across into Nancy, it does not have to attack as long as the German armored army does the attack. But if the German army that moved from Stuttgart and crossed the Maginot line attacks the French infantry army, it would be five to five. But in this example, the Axis player decides to attack only with the armored army and that would be six for the armored army plus two for the air support marker. That's eight to three. And note that none of the German armies in Nancy can support the other's attack because in order to support an attack, a side has to have more armies than the defending side in an area. This example has to do with surrender rules. France is the only country that does not surrender at the end of the turn of the player causing the surrender, but does so at the end of its own turn, if the conditions for surrender are met. So how do Belgium and France surrender? Belgium surrenders if there are two enemy armies in their country, and France surrenders if at the end of the French turn, Belgium has surrendered and there are German armies in three areas of France. So in this case, it is the end of the Axis second turn and Belgium automatically surrenders because there would be at least two German armies in Belgium. 
So the Belgian army is removed. France would still not surrender and would have a counterattack option. Note that this is the end of the German turn. We check for French surrender at the end of the French turn. Note that the Allies could, for example, naval transport the two British armies to London and attack the Germans at Calais with the French armored army and an infantry army and one French infantry army in support. If the two German armies would be eliminated, France would not surrender. However, should a German army survive, France would surrender at the end of Allied turn number two, and all its units would be removed. So this is Downfall of the Third Reich, a game designed by Victor Catala and to be published by Do It Games through a Kickstarter campaign that starts on February 28th. And together with this game, Do It will be kickstarting Downfall of Empires, a game also designed by Victor Catala and with similar mechanics to this one, but that deals with World War I on the strategic level in Europe. So, I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.